Remember that scene in The Matrix where Neo wakes up and realizes the world isn't real? Well, congratulations! You just had your red pill moment, except instead of evil machines, it's a massive electromagnetic pulse that just turned your iPhone into an expensive paperweight. But here's the plot twist Morpheus didn't warn you about. This isn't some Hollywood simulation. This is Tuesday night and your city just got sent back to 1823. No, not the fun steampunk version with fancy goggles, the actual 1823, where people died from infected splinters and thought bathing was optional. Three minutes ago, you are probably scrolling through TikTok, maybe watching some influencer explain why pineapple belongs on pizza. Now you're living in a real-life episode of Black Mirror, specifically the one where technology disappears and everyone loses their minds faster than gamers when servers go down during a major update. The lights didn't just go out, they died. And I mean died, died. Like Jon Snow in Game of Thrones. Except there's no red woman coming to resurrect your Wi-Fi router. Every traffic light is black. Every street lamp is dark. Every emergency exit sign has given up. The city's heartbeat, that constant electrical hum you never noticed, just flatlined. And unlike your favorite Netflix series, this doesn't have a happy ending scheduled for season finale. The uncomfortable truth. You have approximately 4 hours and 37 minutes before civilization becomes a memory. That's not hyperbole, that's mathematics. Cold, unforgiving, peer-reviewed mathematics. Rule 0. The grid was never your friend, it was your dealer. Modern cities are basically giant drug addiction recovery programs, except the drug is electricity and everyone's been using for 150 years. Cut the supply and withdrawal symptoms include mass panic, infrastructure collapse, and neighbor versus neighbor resource wars that make Hunger Games look like a peaceful community potluck. You know how in Fallout the Great War lasted exactly 2 hours and 7 minutes? Real life societal breakdown is actually faster. Studies show urban areas hit critical chaos threshold within 6 to 8 hours of complete power loss. After 72 hours, it's full Mad Max, minus the cool cars because gas pumps need electricity too. The science is beautifully terrifying. Remove electricity from a city and you've essentially performed surgery on a patient without anesthesia. Every vital system starts hemorrhaging simultaneously. Water pressure drops as pumps fail, sewage systems back up, refrigeration stops, food spoils, supply chains snap like guitar strings during a metal concert. But here's what the disaster movies don't tell you. The real killer isn't the lack of resources, it's other people realizing there aren't enough resources. Welcome to Game Theory in Practice, where cooperation sounds great in college textbooks, but desperation makes everyone play defect. Step 1. Navigation in the post-digital wasteland. Your GPS just became as useful as asking Siri for relationship advice. Those satellites are still up there, spinning around Earth like lonely disco balls, but your phone can't talk to them anymore. Time to navigate like your ancestors did, assuming your ancestors weren't complete idiots who walked in circles until they died of exposure. First acknowledge reality. You are now effectively blind in your own city. That confident sense of direction you had, that was Google Maps doing the thinking. Without it, you're basically a toddler in a mall, except the mall is on fire and the toddler needs to survive. Find an analog compass, not the app, an actual magnetic needle that points north because physics doesn't care about your data plan. Hardware stores, camping sections, auto parts shops, some cars still have them built into mirrors. Grab multiple compasses if possible because redundancy is the difference between navigation and expensive wandering. No compass? Make one. This isn't Pinterest DIY nonsense. This is actual survival science. Take any iron needle or straight pen. Magnetize it by stroking it with the magnet in one direction exactly 50 times. The magnetic domains in the metal align, creating a temporary compass. Float it on a small piece of cork or foam in still water. Physics works even when civilization doesn't. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Revolutionary concept, I know. At solar noon, shadows point north in the northern hemisphere, south if you're below the equator. Use an analog watch as a compass. Point the hour hand at the sun, halfway between the hour hand and 12 is self. But here's the survival hack nobody talks about. Moss doesn't actually grow on the north side of trees. That's folklore garbage that kills people. Instead, learn your city's layout before you need it. Major rivers, interstate highways, mountain ranges, these are permanent landmarks that don't need batteries. Mark your route with something permanent. Chalk washes away in rain. Spray paint works better. Reflective tape catches light even from dying phone flashlights. Think Hensel and Gretel, but with realistic expectations about breadcrumb effectiveness and significantly higher stakes. 
Step 2. Water, the 72-hour death timer. Your body is roughly 60% water, which sounds like a comfortable margin until you realize you're constantly losing that water through breathing, sweating, and other biological functions that continue operating even during apocalyptic scenarios. Three days without water, that's your hard deadline. Not feeling thirsty, actual cellular death from dehydration. Your blood becomes syrup, your brain stops functioning, your kidneys shut down like overheated computers. It's not a pleasant process and it's not negotiable. City water systems are technological marvels that require constant electrical life support. Water treatment plants, booster pumps, pressure systems, all dead. Those taps in your apartment? They might have residual pressure for a few hours, maybe less. Fill every container you can find right now. Bathtubs, pots, buckets, clean garbage cans, water stored is water earned. Rain collection becomes your new religion. Any clean surface works. Tarps, plastic sheeting, even garbage bags if they're not contaminated. Physics helps here. Water flows downhill and collects in low spots. Set up funnels using cut bottles or improvised channels. First flush diverting is crucial. Let the initial rain wash dirt and bird droppings off your collection surface before you start capturing drinking water. Purification without modern technology requires understanding basic chemistry. Boiling kills pathogens through thermal destruction of proteins and cell membranes. One minute of rolling boil at sea level, three minutes at altitude. Fuel is precious, so this isn't your first choice unless you're swimming in combustible materials. Solar disinfection sodas is your friend. Clear plastic bottles filled with water laid horizontally in direct sunlight for six to eight hours. UV radiation penetrates the plastic and damages pathogen DNA. It's like giving bacteria a lethal sunburn. Works best between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. when UV intensity peaks. Cloudy weather requires longer exposure times. No sun for days? Welcome to chemical warfare against microorganisms. Iodine tablets from camping stores work, but follow directions exactly. Too little and you'll still get sick. Too much and you'll poison yourself with iodine. Water sources in order of preference. Bottled water you find, rainwater you collect, water from hot water heaters, drain from the bottom valves, water from toilet tanks, not bowls obviously, natural sources like streams, avoid obviously contaminated sources, standing water, anything with algae blooms, water near industrial areas. Step three, fire, your primitive technological edge. Fire represents the difference between human and prey animal. It's cooking, warmth, water purification, light, psychological comfort, and threat to turn, all rolled into one package. Master fire, and you've essentially upgraded from Stone Age to Bronze Age in terms of survival capability. Most people attempt friction fire because it looks primitive and satisfying in movies. Reality check. Friction fire making is a skilled trade that requires practice, proper materials, and ideal conditions. Attempting it for the first time during an emergency is like trying to learn surgery while bleeding out. The bow drill method works if you understand the physics. Mechanical friction converts to heat through molecular agitation. You need hardwood for the spindle, oak, hickory, ash, softwood for the fireboard, cedar, pine, bass. The spindle creates wood dust heated to combustion temperature. This hot dust, tinder bundle, catches the ember you create. Chemical shortcuts exist if you're not committed to authentic caveman experience. Hand sanitizer burns because it's basically flavored ethanol. Nail polish remover ignites easily. Acetone is highly flammable. Char cloth catches sparks like it's been designed for the job, because it has been. Make char cloth by partially burning cotton fabric in an oxygen-limited environment. A tin can with a small hole works. Fire triangle. Heat, fuel, oxygen. Remove any element and your fire dies. Heat starts the reaction, fuel sustains it, oxygen enables combustion. Build fires in progressive stages. Tinder catches spark, kindling builds flame, fuel would maintain burn. Violate the sequence and you'll waste precious resources creating smoke and disappointment. Tinder materials in urban environment. Dryer lint, vapor, cardboard, birch bark, pine needles, fine steel wool with battery sparks. Kindling, pencil thick to finger thick dry wood. Split wood catches faster than round wood. Fuel, arm thick and larger pieces for sustained burn. Fire location matters. Clear area of flammable debris, wind protection, heat reflection, stone wall or metal sheet, proximity to fuel sources. Don't build fires inside unless you have proper ventilation. Carbon monoxide poisoning is a stupid way to die when you've survived this far. Step four, urban mobility in the new stone age. Your car is now a very expensive storage container. Gas stations need electricity for pumps. Electric vehicles need charging stations. Even hybrid vehicles eventually run out of gas. Public transportation is completely dead. Trains, buses, elevators all require power grid connectivity. Bicycles become the supreme urban mobility solution. No fuel requirements, maintainable with basic tools, capable of carrying supplies, faster than walking, quieter than motorcycles. Mountain bikes handle debris and rough terrain better than road bikes. Stock up on spare inner tubes, patches, pump, basic tools. Flat tires are inevitable when roads fill with glass, nails, and metal debris from accidents. Bicycle maintenance science, tire pressure affects rolling resistance and puncture vulnerability. Underinflated tires increase rolling resistance but provide cushioning over rough terrain. Overinflated tires roll efficiently but puncture easily. Find the middle ground based on conditions. 
Walking remains the ultimate backup plan. Comfortable broken-in boots are worth more than designer electronics now. Blisters slow you down. Infected blisters stop you permanently. Prevention, properly fitting footwear, moisture wicking socks, moleskin or duct tape on hot spots before they become problems. Route planning requires strategic thinking. Avoid major highways where everyone else will travel, stay near water sources, plan for overnight stops, identify potential supply locations. Highways become parking lots when fuel runs out and become battlegrounds when tempers escalate. Urban terrain navigation. Memorize major landmarks, street patterns, bridge locations. Rivers are barriers that channel movement. Know where bridges are. High-rise areas create wind tunnels and provide vantage points, but trap you if elevators fail. Industrial areas might have supplies that also hazardous materials. Step five, advanced scavenging with scientific method. Every abandoned building becomes a potential resource node, but approach with systematic methodology rather than desperate grabbing. Think like a scientist studying post-civilization archeology. span Battery technology works on stored electrochemical energy. Car batteries contain 12 volts of direct current useful for powering LED lights, small electronics, radio equipment. Connect batteries in series to increase voltage, parallel to increase capacity. Basic electrical engineering that might keep communications equipment running long enough to coordinate with other survivors. Even dead batteries often retain partial charge. Automotive batteries discharge slowly and might have enough power for essential electronics. Flashlight batteries in series can jumpstart some devices. Phone batteries can be harvested and combined for emergency power. Medication science, expiration dates indicate peak potency, not sudden toxicity. Most medications retain effectiveness well past expiration, though potency gradually decreases. Insulin and liquid antibiotics degrade fastest. Pain relievers, antihistamines, basic first aid supplies maintain effectiveness longer. Life-threatening conditions justify using expired medications when fresh ones aren't available. Tool priority hierarchy based on versatility and durability. Fixed blade knife, cutting, food preparation, defense, prying, multi-tool, pliers, screwdrivers, additional blades, rope or paracord, securing loads, climbing, shelter construction, duct tape, repairs, waterproofing, securing, lighter or fire starter, obvious applications, flashlight with extra batteries, basic first aid supplies. Resource locations, pharmacies for medical supplies, hardware stores for tools, camping stores for outdoor equipment, auto parts stores for batteries and tools, restaurants for canned goods and cooking equipment, office buildings for basic supplies and potential shelter. Step six, psychological warfare and human threat assessment. Zombies are fictional, desperate humans making rational decisions about resource scarcity are terrifyingly real. Humans under stress revert to tribal thinking, us versus them, zero-sum competition, survival of most aggressive. Game theory applies directly in resource-scarce environments, cooperation benefits everyone long-term, but defection, taking more than sharing, benefits individuals short-term. When survival is uncertain, short-term thinking dominates. Expect people to choose immediate advantage over community benefit. Stealth becomes essential survival skill. Sound carries farther in quiet environments. No traffic noise, air conditioning, electronic hum to mask your activities. Light attracts attention like signals to other survivors, but also advertises your location to potential threats. Cooking smells travel surprising distances when competing odors disappear. Travel timing strategy, dawn and dusk provide enough light to navigate while avoiding midday heat and midnight cold. Most people sleep during traditional hours, reducing encounter probability. Weather affects travel conditions, rain provides noise cover, but reduces visibility and increases exposure risk. Group dynamics create security versus resource trade-offs. Solo travel is efficient and but dangerous. Small groups two to four people provide security and skill diversity without massive resource drain. Large groups require more resources and create organizational challenges, but offer better defense capabilities. Trust evaluation criteria, demonstrated competence under stress, willingness to share resources equitably, compatible risk tolerance, complementary skills. Desperation makes people unpredictable. Someone who seems reasonable while well-fed might become dangerous when hungry. Step seven, long-term strategic thinking. Immediate survival for 72 hours focuses on basic needs, water, food, shelter, security, Medium-term survival, weeks to months, requires sustainable resource acquisition and territory control. Long-term survival, months to years, demands community building and specialized skill development. Urban environments become resource deserts once supply chains break. Cities concentrate population but depend entirely on external inputs. Rural areas have lower population density, local food production, water sources, and populations with more diverse practical skills. Migration timing matters. Leave too early and you abandon potential resources. Leave too late and face overwhelming competition for limited exit routes. Sweet spot appears to be 24 to 48 hours after initial crisis. Early enough to avoid worst chaos, late enough to gather necessary supplies. 
seasonal considerations affect long-term planning. Winter requires more calories and better shelter, spring enables foraging and farming, summer provides maximum daylight and plant growth, fall offers harvest opportunities but warns of approaching winter, plan movement and settlement timing around climate cycles, skill prioritization for post-collapse society, food production and preservation, water location and purification, basic medical care, mechanical repair, construction and shelter building, defense and security, leadership and organization. Modern professional skills like marketing, financial analysis, and social media management become largely worthless. The Mathematics of Survival Probability Statistical analysis of historical disasters shows predictable patterns. 10% of population evacuates immediately, 80% waits for official guidance, 10% never leaves regardless of circumstances. The immediate evacuees have highest survival rates. The waiters face increasing danger as resources deplete and social order breaks down. The never leavers become statistics. Resource depletion follows exponential curves, not linear ones. Water disappears faster than expected because everyone hoards simultaneously. Food scarcity accelerates as supply chains fail and preservation breaks down. Competition for remaining resources intensifies beyond sustainable levels. Human behavioral patterns under extreme stress? First 24 hours feature shock and disbelief. 24 to 72 hours bring anger and desperate activity. 72 hours to one week create acceptance or complete breakdown. Survivors who adapt thinking patterns within the first week have dramatically better long-term prospects. Violence probability increases with resource scarcity and decreases with time as unstable individuals eliminate themselves through poor decisions. Initial chaos is most dangerous. Survivors who make it past the first two weeks tend to settle into sustainable patterns. The final calculation. Every choice is now a survival equation with permanent consequences. Help others and risk resource depletion. Travel alone and risk isolation death. Stay in the city and face resource competition. Leave the city and face unknown territory challenges. Mathematical optimization suggests gather essential supplies immediately, form small trusted group, leave urban areas within 48 hours, head for rural regions with water sources and lower population density, prioritize sustainable resources over hoarded supplies. But mathematics doesn't account for human variables, loyalty, courage, creativity, determination. The survivors won't necessarily be the ones with perfect calculations, they'll be the ones who adapt fastest when calculations prove wrong. Most people will apply pre-crisis thinking to post-crisis reality. They'll wait for rescue that isn't coming, they'll expect social systems to restart, they'll trust in government responses that can't materialize without infrastructure. The ones who survive will be the ones who immediately accept the new rules. Resources are scarce, cooperation is valuable but not guaranteed, violence is possible from desperate people, self-reliance determines outcomes. The moment of choice. You have maybe two hours of darkness left before dawn reveals the true scope of the catastrophe. Two hours to decide whether you're going to be part of the 10% who act immediately, the 80% who wait for guidance, or the 10% who never accept reality. The science doesn't negotiate. Physics laws operate the same whether civilization works or not. Chemical reactions continue. Biological needs remain constant. Mathematics calculates probability regardless of your feelings about those probabilities. You can master these forces through knowledge and preparation, or they'll master you through ignorance and wishful thinking. Darwin doesn't care about your previous lifestyle, education level, or social status. Evolution operates through differential survival rates based on adaptation speed. This isn't a temporary emergency with scheduled rescue. This isn't a plot device that resolves in two hours with clever technological solutions. This is permanent change that requires permanent adaptation. The old world ended when the lights went out. The new world belongs to whoever learns fastest, adapts quickest, and applies scientific thinking to primitive conditions. Your smartphone battery has maybe 6% charge left. Use it wisely, maybe to read this script one more time before the screen goes dark forever. Welcome to your new reality, evolution in fast forward, survival of the fittest, measured in hours instead of millennia. Make your choice, make it now, make it final, because in this game, respawn isn't an option, and game over means exactly what it says. The blackout isn't temporary, the chaos isn't random, and the only rescue coming is the one you create for yourself. Time's up, survivor. Physics class is in session and the exam is pass or die.